Oh, yeah, I'm just wondering if you could present the argument because I don't, I didn't hear it presented clearly during your discussion with the other guy. Um, have you read the text file that I pasted? Yes. So what about that is not clear? Do you want to go through the text file? Yes. Okay, let me just put it in Word so it's like bigger on my screen. Is it an argument against agnosticism or an argument for God? That's the it's, first thing I saw. No, like. so it's an argument against agnosticism. Okay, and kind well, of agnosticism. Uh, like, to be a little bit more specific, I think agnosticism is agnosticism should be considered a positive position. Like, wait. if you have a positive belief that there is no possible evidence for the existence of a God. My argument doesn't say anything about that. Wait, wait. So, sorry, I didn't hear the last part. Are you saying it's an argument? What, by agnosticism, are you so taking, my like, argument, doing it? Wait, so, hold on. Is it, are you talking about like strong or weak agnosticism? Or are you merely talking about agnosticism as suspending belief on affirming or negating a proposition? So I'm just defining, like, I think technically we, at the start of the debate, agreed to define agnosticism as some degree of certainty or some degree of uncertainty between a 95% belief that God does exist or a 5% belief that God does not exist. And I, I consider, I, I consider like complete, uh, I consider the idea of a totally weak agnostic position, like the idea that we technically can't be absolutely certain whether God exists or not, to just be like that state basically applies to every possible belief we have. So there's no point in even having a word to describe it. Yeah, um, that's a weird definition of agnosticism. Are you saying that? So I asked you, are you talking about weak agnosticism, which would just be the thesis that? the existence or non-existence of a god or a deity is currently unknown, but it is not necessarily unknowable, right? And then you have strong agnosticism, which is going to be the thesis that the existence or non-existence of god or a deity is unknowable by reason of our natural inability to verify an experience with anything, um, meaning that not only is it impossible to find out whether God exists or doesn't exist now, but it's ultimately so. That's going to be the case in the future and has been in the past. Whereas the weak position is just to say it is the case now, but it's not necessarily so. It could change in the future or so much, right? And then you also have agnosticism, the way it's used in like literature or philosophy of religion, where you just mean that you don't take an affirming dogmatic attitude towards a proposition. For example, you don't affirm the proposition that God exists, nor do you negate that proposition, right? You suspend belief. So I'm just wondering, I'm assuming these are not the, what you mean by agnosticism. You have some complete different definition of agnosticism that has something to do with degrees of certainty or whatnot. So could yes. you just explain so, that? So basically, my argument is that there's going to be three Justifiable, justifiable positions on the question of God's existence. One of them is going to amount to a positive belief in God. The other one is going to amount to a positive, like what you would call strong agnosticism, the idea that no evidence can, uh, can verify the existence. Like the idea that the question isn't even really susceptible to like evidence. And the other one is like a positive rejection of God, but that the soft, like the negative proposition of just saying that we don't know, like the weak agnosticism is to me an unjustifiable proposition. And I do define it as a degree of certainty, but that's because I don't think there's any belief. Like if there is a belief that's certain, 
to be true or false, it's going to be something like a equals a or one plus one equals two. And if that were be like, if that's the standard we use to just say we believe something, then everybody would always say they're agnostic about everything. And we wouldn't even bother uh, making up a word to describe it. So the argument is supposed to show that only one of three options are possible. Either an affirming the proposition that God exists, or a strong form of Gnosticism where whether or not God exists, we can never find or we can never verify or falsify that proposition. Um, or sort of just atheism that we negate the proposition that God exists. Merely saying that, merely suspending belief, not affirming it or negating it, is not going to be possible. Which is what the argument is going to show. Did I did I understand that correctly? Oh, so I'm not saying it's not possible. I'm saying it's not justified. Sorry. So sorry. Um, epistemically, it's you're going to be epistemically unjustified if you suspend belief and you don't take one of the three options that you presented: affirming the proposition, negating the proposition, or saying that you can't affirm it nor negate it. Both. Uh, so you can't verify it or falsify it. Those are the only three that are justified. But merely suspending belief is not justified. Would that be correct? Yes. Okay. So what's the, so what's the argument? I assume it's some kind of a Bayesian um, argument from religious experience. Yes, that's what it is. So at the uh, at the bottom of that text file, there is a Bayesian equation where, like, like I define the terms. What I'm saying is, given the number of religious experiences that have been reported. The only just like the only way that equation is going to make sense is if either we assume the posterior probability of God's existence is high enough such that uh, agnosticism is unjustified, or the prior probability of God's existence is considered to be so low that it would reasonably be characterized as atheism, or that the probability of uh, what was it? Uh, P, like the probability of someone having a religious experience, the other term is going to be almost zero. So, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, so the we term, might, of, we might have to the go term that I'm talking about sorry. is the uh, the probability of someone observing God. Given the existence of God divided by the probability of someone observing God for any reason. And I would say that if considering that position, considering that that probability to, to be zero, or sorry, to be like sufficiently low should be considered to be effectively like a strong agnostic position. Sorry, I know that I'm rambling. So... You're not trying to prove God. You're just saying that whatever you whatever you insert for, you know, the priors for priors for A and priors for B, and then B conditioned on A, uh, you're either gonna get something low, right? And that being low, that's going to justify um, that's going to justify atheism, or you're gonna get it high, which is that's going to justify theism. Or it's got or, but which option is going to justify um, strong agnosticism? Like, what would the probability be that justifies strong agnosticism the most? Okay, so the mathematical situation I think would justify strong agnosticism would be the idea that human experiences are fundamentally uncorrelated to that human religious experiences or human any possible way that a human could have of knowing about God is completely uncorrelated to the actual existence of God. So, Which in that equation, it really sucks because I have my push to talk as like the letter V. So whenever I try to look at the document and talk, it screws me. Um, so if you're saying that the all of the probability numbers are sort of inscrutable, that would justify uh, strong agnosticism. No. So the situation that I think would justify strong, like, uh, so 
The equation has basically three terms. And what I'm saying is there's the posterior probability, which is our probability, like our estimate of the idea that God exists, is going to be very high by virtue of the amount of small pieces of evidence that we have, unless one of the other two terms is close to zero. And I think either of those terms being sufficiently close to zero would qualify as either uh, strong agnosticism or just atheism. Yeah, I know. It's, I probably uh, should change that. No, yeah, I think I think there's like a lot of issues here. But like, let's start one. Uh, one second, let me just open the word. So you said that. Uh, Uh, you said B A B conditioned on A is going to be very high. I think it will, unless either uh, P of A or P of uh, A conditioned on B over B is close to zero, because what we're going to be doing is we're going to be summing up using like the log odds method. We're going to be summing up a large number, a very large number of relatively small pieces of evidence in favor of the existence of God. I have a problem. Being a tie, something like 0 0.7 or something. In, in I'm fact, sorry. Sorry, go ahead. I didn't hear the last thing you said, I'm sorry. Uh, the clay, so B B is merely going to be B is merely going to be um, the set of all humans who have who claims to have had religious experiences, right? Yes. So that's gonna be like a hundred. Then you have um, how likely is it that P sorry I keep disconnecting, I'm not used to push to talk. And then you have the other claim. Um, fuck, let me open up. And then you have the other claim, which is that uh, how likely is it that people would be claiming to have religious experience if God exists, right? Uh, that's B condition upon yes. A. And that's going to be um, pretty high, too. That's going to be like uh, 0 0.7 or something. Something like that. I assume you would agree with that number, right? Hello? Uh, I, I think, sure. Sure. All right. So P. So the priors of B would be like 100, would be like 1, and priors of B conditioned on A would be 70. And now the only qu question then would be something like, given our background knowledge, how probable is A, the priors of A, right? And I would personally give that very low. I'll give that like 1 or 2, possibly even 0, maybe 1, 1%, like 0 0.01. Um, and it will come out, the probability that God exists given um, these testimonies would come out as something very low, something like 0 0.014 or something like that. And that, under your view, would then justify um, atheism. But had it come out high, it would have justified theism. But under what would it have justified strong agnosticism? That, so that's, that's the question I'm trying to figure out now. Okay, so there are... There are basically... The situation that I think would represent strong agnosticism would be that the question of whether God exists is unrelated to like human experiences. Okay. So then you would just run. Yeah, but that's what I said earlier. I said then you would just have that the probabilities would be um, unscrutable. And then you said, no, I don't agree with that's what the position would be. So I think a strong agnostic would have to, to be like a truly strong agnostic, you have to believe that there's no possible evidence in favor of the existence of God. Or at least, there, which or I don't, I don't even know if it's, or against him. 
Yes, that's so that situation to me in the equation is described by um, the probability of the the probability of someone having an experience of God given the existence of God divided by the probability of someone having the experience of God for any reason. Because that what that would come out to, obviously, the probability of having a uh, experience of God for any reason is going to be the probability of having a true experience of God plus the probability of having a false uh, experience of God. And if strong agnosticism is true, nobody is experiencing God. So whether God exists or not, in that situation, all experiences of God would have to be assumed to be false experiences since they're not correlated to like reality. Okay. And just hey, just so sure. you know, I understand that the, the way that I'm using the term agnosticism is a little bit unorthodox. No, but I have a question. Though. So I'm um, what if because there's other problems because all you have here, right, is you have like one I still haven't understood how the strong agnosticism comes in, but like even just within this argument, what if the probability that comes out, what if A on B comes out as 0 0.5? How is that not just standard agnosticism? At the most epistemically justified thing to do at that point is to suspend belief, neither affirm it nor negate it. Okay, so what I'm saying is that that formula describe like that that formula describes our update to our prior basically what i'm saying is you have to multiply technically it's not like you have to sum it using like logarithm stuff but like technically assuming some degree of independence like some degree of conditional independence in the reasons why people are experiencing the existence of god you basically have to add them all up. And even though there are going to be some reasonable ways of like, uh, there are going to be some reasonable ways of discounting some people's experience, the total number of people is going to be somewhere, it's going to be in the billions probably. And since you have billions of pieces of evidence, if each of those billions of pieces of evidence is providing really any amount of conditionally independent evidence in favor of the idea that God exists, you're going to find yourself eventually coming to the conclusion that God exists. And the only way you can avoid that, in my opinion, is by having either P equal to some very low number. And I think a, a number that low should just be described as atheism, not theism. Or to have... Uh, to have B conditioned on A over B being so low, or being, actually it would be one, it wouldn't be low. Being so close to one that you're, you're at that point, you would be basically saying human experiences do not give us any information. No experience a person can have can provide us with evidence to believe in or disbelieve in God. And yeah, technically, I, I know, so just, just so we're clear, I know that technically it's always going to be possible to choose very specific numbers to get whatever results you want. But that would require like a very, very specific number for P. And I don't think there's any way of justifying that specific number, whatever it would turn out to be. Yeah, but now that would be a different discussion. Then we're just disputing about what probability to assign to each of the three, right? Because if someone says, given the background knowledge or whatever, um, I'm, I'm, I'm like I'm like a 50-50 type, um, whether God exists or not, you know? Um, so I'm going to assign P of A, uh, uh, the probability of A something like 50%. And then given that there are testimonies, B is going to be 100%. And you could also say that if someone could also uh, uh, hold the, uh, ascribe the probability that if God exists, there would be people having religious experiences as one, right? So 0 0.5 for God's priors, 0 0.5 priors for B, 
and sorry, 0 0.5 for priors valid exist, 100 for the priors of that people have religious uh, testimonies. Uh, 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 testimonies conditioned upon God exists would be one as well. That would give you the probability of 0 0.5. If you get that 0. Point, uh, if you get that probability of 0 0.5, that would be just the, the epistemically right thing to do. There would just be to be an agnostic. The type of agnosticism that you're um, trying to sort of show is unjust given this argument. But there's nothing in your notepad that says that the outcome can come out as 0 0.5, as far as I saw. OK, so I think I'm not being 100% clear. So what I'm, what I'm saying is that equation represents the situation of one person claiming to have a religious experience. And just like with any other claim, each time a person, like, I mean, there are some exceptions, but for the most part, each time a person makes a claim about some fact, that should be counted as some evidence in favor of that fact. So the number of people who claim throughout history of having religious experiences, unless you could find some way of discounting them all, which I don't think you can without either assuming God doesn't exist or assuming that there's no way of knowing God exists, you would, you would have to agree with them. And I think like to draw an analogy, like if there are a hundred people and nobody has any proof, but they all say they saw some event, you would just reasonably conclude that the event happened. Unless you had, like, if you knew they were all in the mafia or something, then I guess you might reject it. But in that case, you would be making, like, you would be, like, you would need to have some positive reason for why you think they're lying. I don't see how any of this addresses the question I asked. So what I'm saying is you're not going to be able to wind up with a probability like 0.5. <sighs> Because what we're doing is we're summing up the individual pieces of evidence that we got from everyone who claims to have, like, had an experience of God's existence. And since that's going to be billions of people, we're going to have billions of pieces of evidence, which none of them are going to be completely insignificant. And so if you have billions of pieces of evidence in favor of some proposition and just by it's pretty much impossible in this case to have a lot of evidence against it because people not perceiving something as a lot weaker evidence against any claim than the evidence provided by someone claiming to have seen it so basically what i'm saying is if you think we should update our estimate of the probability that god exists at all when we learn of someone who claims to have had an experience with God, then by virtue of the sheer number of people who, who uh, claim to have had those experiences, you're going to wind up with a very high probability. Yeah, but that doesn't matter. I said both of them could be one. How would they be one? Look, are you talking, are you talking about, uh, you're talking about uh, the priors of B, right? Yes. Let's just clarify. A A is God exists, and B yes. is B going to be a single person who claimed to perceive God, or all persons in history who have claimed to have seen God? What is what it's, is B going to be? It's going to be a single person. Okay. So a single person, a single person has claims to have had a religious experience. Okay, so. If you take if you take that if you take that um, we don't have any reason not to assign it a very high probability that the person has had a religious experience, right? You don't disagree with that? No, I don't. Okay. So would you disagree with even putting it as one? I would disagree with putting it at one. I think you could put it somewhere between point twenty five and point 90 maybe 0 0.25 and 0 0.75 okay no problem I, I don't necessarily think it's even possible 
outside like really like obvious definitionally true statements to have a probability of one no pro something like 97 um and uh and given that given what well, what probability would you assign that such a person would be having religious experiences if god exists Hello. Okay, so you're asking what how likely is it that someone would have a religious experience if God exists? Yeah, I'm just asking where what would you put B as A? B conditioned on A. The probability of B conditioned given A. The probability that that person would have a religious experience if God exists. So it would be relatively close to whatever the probability is now like whatever the actual probability of people who claim to have religious experiences i do not know the exact number and i don't think you can know it without being able to make like specific claims about the existence of god the only claim I think I can make is that it's going to be more likely. It's it's a it's going to be more likely if God exists to a significant enough degree that liter that if you multiply it by literally billions of times, you're going to wind up with an undeniable amount of evidence. All right, so are you going to take it to be high or not? Uh, I'll take it to be high. Okay, good. And what's the probability of just what's the priors on God existing? Given background knowledge. Okay, um, I'll say, I guess I will give... I'll give about sixty-five percent. You think you think given background knowledge it's more plausible that God exists than he doesn't exist? No, okay, yeah, no, you caught me. Um I just say that the prior so no you let's just say that all of the arguments there's no yeah, you're right. There's no way like for me natural. to justify there is no way for me to justify uh, a probability that high. It's probably somewhere oh, no, no, around hold, the order hold of on, like, hold on, hold on. It's probably just, somewhere around the order of like Point oh oh one actually. No 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 no. It doesn't have to be that low. So let's just take that all of the arguments for God, right? The kalam, contingency, uh, argument from reason, fine tuning, ontological argument. Let's say let's say that all of those fail, and also let's say that the arguments for against atheism, like the logical problem of evil, the evidential problem of evil, argument from hiddenness. Uh, and other uh, other sorts of arguments, uh, you know, uh, the problem like problems with uh, with disembodied mind and all of that. Let's just say that they also fail, right? So all arguments for God fail, and all arguments for uh, all arguments for God's existence fail, and all arguments against His existence fail, right? I just assume that to be the case, right? Um, it seems it seems whether God exists or not, given that there is no argument for or against, we could put it at like fifty percent. Do you have a problem with that? Um, sort of. So I think in the absence of evidence, the prior probability of almost any proposition would be pretty low. Like if I just, if I wrote out like a random sentence, the odds of it somehow being a true sentence would be really, really low. So... I'm I'm kind of inclined to say that a D, like a normal probability for something we don't know anything about is actually very low. If we if we have a proposition, if we have a proposition and we don't have a reason to affirm it and we don't have any reason to negate it, uh, it's mutually uh, its affirmation and its negation are mutually exclusive and they're jointly exhausted, right? Either uh, if God exists, then he doesn't exist. If he doesn't exist, uh, then he doesn't. Sorry. Either God exists or he doesn't exist. These are mutually exclusive. 
Okay, one is the negation of the other, and they're jointly exhaustive. Okay, no, no, right? yeah, sorry. So, so I, I think the principle, so if we just apply the principle of indifference, we're going to get a probability for h to be 0 0.5. I could go along with that. Which is 50%. Okay, and you gave 97, and you gave 97, 97 for each of those, right? Sorry? And we gave 0 0.97 to both of those earlier, right? So now let me let me let, now look at the calculation. Going by the numbers that you gave. I'm going to post it in general. Okay, cool, cool. There you go. <laughs> the probability that God exists given all of this is, is, is going to be 0.5%. Okay, so and that is like an So, do you think the millions? Of, do you think a proposition is more likely to be true if a billion people have said it's true compared to if one person says it's true? Whether I know nothing at all about the people. Yes, because, you know nothing at all about the people. Um, intuitively, as I, um. I don't know, like the education level or anything. It's quick. Um, See, it's a million I'm not. It's it's really it's it's, re it's really it's really hard to say. So, if it was plan? like, if you ask me, like in America or in Europe or some educated or some population that I that I knew of, uh, it, it, like like if I don't know anything, I, I'm not I'm not sure. Don't you think that your evaluation of whether a claim is true or not has some correlation to whether it's true? Um, are you talking just intuitively or if I reason just to the through any, through any possible process you have, do you yeah. think that process correlates somehow to truth? Um, well, that's a bit tricky though, given... Well, I mean, I'm, truth, I, just, I don't want to take any, like, I just want to take a no. really naive view of truth. Sure, sure. Um, I would say yes. Sure. So my argument is that if we're going to assume that our thoughts, whatever they are, um, especially when it comes to when it comes to intuition and when it comes to the evidence of our direct experience, if that situation represents any evidence, and if uh, if that situation represents any evidence in favor of a proposition in general, like if you don't know what the proposition is, if you don't know what the proposition is and you're going to, uh, you're going to, all you know, okay, no, I'm, I'm rambling, I'm sorry. So if you know nothing about a proposition except that you agree with it, oh shit. Okay, so I think I might be in a bind. What I'm trying to say is that if the only information we have about some proposition, and we'll just say it's proposition P, we don't know anything about it, we can't make any specific claim about it at all, is that there's some human who believes that proposition to be true then we should consider that as being some evidence, not necessarily strong evidence, but some degree of evidence in favor of that proposition actually being true. Uh, wait, you don't know anything about the individual. The only yeah. So I'm saying I humans, and I'm saying there is a correlation. Like, well, specifically, yeah, you Forget. don't know anything about the okay. individual. So I'm just saying me, there's a correlation. Let me ask the question. Okay, so you're asking. We don't know anything about the person and we don't know what the proposition in question is. We just know that there is a proposition in question that some human being, we don't know where he's from, his background, even the time that he lives in. Um, would that count as evidence that that proposition is true? No. Why would yes. it be? Because human beings in general, when considering some particular proposition, are more likely to come to the conclusion that that proposition is true if it is in fact true than if it is not true. 
Like, and I think, I think if you rejected that idea, there would be a question of how, how could you draw a distinction between yourself so that your thoughts can correlate to reality if you don't believe the human mind in general is, uh, is structured in a way that correlates to reality. Wait, what's the, what's the argument? What's okay, the difference? So, just, to, just like I'm so tracking you. You're saying that if you don't affirm that the, if you don't affirm that av an average individual whom you know nothing about um, affirming a proposition, that's going to be evidence for the truth of that proposition. And if you don't affirm that proposition, that's going to entail that you're not justified in believing in your own, own cognitive faculties. Was that your was that your claim? Yes. Yeah, you're gonna have to show me the entailment, like. Okay, so let me let me try to make the argument. One thing I admit it does rest on the idea of humans being fundamentally similar. So the human brain was created by some process, which it could be a god, it could be evolution, it could be whatever. And if the like a if that process somehow the, if the process of our creation somehow caused our brains the beliefs that we have in our brains to correlate to reality in some way, then we should assume that a human brain, on average, is going to be correlated to reality on some proposition. If they have well. In general, like a human who evaluates a proposition in general, on average, averaged across all humans and all propositions, we are more likely to believe something is true if it is true than we are to believe it's true if it's false. Uh, let me just write down the premises. And if you don't believe that the process, like the process of the human brain, fundamentally correlates to truth, I don't see how you could possibly believe that your specific brain does. The only exception I think would be if you had like a really technical matter, like most people couldn't even have an opinion in theory, or if you had some way of like validating yourself as an expert, and then I think you could justify taking your own opinion into account, but rejecting other people's. But if we have a situation where there's no way of objectively verifying that one person is an expert, or that one person, uh, there's no way of justifying, oh my God, there's no way of verifying the idea that one person has such a stronger claim to truth than anybody else that it should be considered just the overriding basis for the decision. Wait, I mean, I need to write down the argument like you just went too fast. Like the only premise that I really got was that the first premise is going to be that humans are similar because they've been created by the same process. Is that, yes. is that correct? Yes. So if that process, whether it was conscious or unconscious, if the process that created humans created us in correspondence with some truth, then that means, I'm sorry, if, if it, if the process that created the human brain created it to reason effectively Yeah, we're going to have to take it premise by premise. Just chill. Okay. I'm going to uh, figure out what I'm sorry. I know I sound like, frustrated. I think it's just because I've been talking be, for so long. What's up? be compacted into one premise, just premise one being that, in general, humans' beliefs correlate to reality or the truth. Yeah, so to me, that would... I would... I would be willing to put that in one premise, but if you want justification, then... Yeah, but that's that's a claim he's looking to justify, though. You uh, do you reject the claim? I'm I'm just surprised. The claim that most believe human beings hold are, are oh, false or are true. No, sorry. Oh, yeah. The claim that um, I think I'm sympathetic that they're mostly false. Yeah. Oh, okay. so you think on in general? humans form more false beliefs than true beliefs yes why do you think so that? i just uh, hey sorry. guys I just, wait i don't i don't i don't, I don't like the uh i don't i don't i don't like the turnaround here of of trying to 
force the burden of proof onto Venus when he's not making claims right now, right? He's just looking at the other guy's claim. He wants an argument for it. Yeah, so. sure. I don't mind yeah, justifying yeah, that claim. If you want. Right. Right. I, I know. I know you don't mind, and I know. I know you'll get into a whole debate about it. But I don't. I don't. I feel like I want this guy's argument to get fully deconstructed, and it seems like that's on the verge of happening. And then whoever that was that came in was kind of contributing to like spinning the burden of proof onto you for a kind of related claim. I, I was not digging that. Let's just continue with what we were doing with you asking this guy for his argument. Yeah, that's probably the better course of action. Okay, uh, so let me... But I think Orson kind of just confused the entire thing because he made the previous thing. So let me just rewrite the first premise and then go to... So the first premise I wrote for you was humans are similarly create are similar because they're created by the same process. Yes. So now I have a conditional. If... So if that process created us somehow selecting for the ability to form true beliefs, then the human brain, the beliefs that a human has on average would be expected to correlate to true beliefs. And I'm not saying that means Mo I'm not. I'm not saying that that means uh, most people have mostly true beliefs, and I'm not saying that if someone believes something, that means it's probably true. I'm just saying, like if we had uh, if we had a hundred different propositions, and we had a thousand different people each evaluate each of that proposition, each of those propositions, um, those propositions that would be true would be more likely to be evaluated as being true. So this is the argument here. It's going to be, sorry, I just hate using push -tool. So your first premise is going to be um, something like human beings have similar cognitive faculties because they're created by the same process. I'm assuming natural selection. Um, if we are created by the same process, natural selection, which uh, which selects for true belief, then the beliefs produced by human cognitive faculties would mostly be true. So I'm going to put something. No, like, I don't think I don't think they would mostly that, be true. I think they would have some correlation to truth. So, so if it's if it's not mostly true, then most of your beliefs would end up being false. Most of your it, it beliefs. Has, I mean, this is something done in discussions with EAA and a lot. The evolutionary argument. If if you want to, if if you're talking that, if, if we're discussing whether or not the cognitive faculties of human beings, which produces beliefs, is a reliable belief-producing mechanism, you would have to put the number at at least seventy-five out of every hundred beliefs produced are true, or something like that. So, it's, in other words, it's going to mostly be true beliefs. That's how you want to phrase it. So, the only reason why I think that's not true is I think. There are infinitely many more false statements than true statements. No, but that's so like that's relevant. See, if if in order for your argument to work, you would have you would have to one assume that all human beings have been produced by the same process, natural selection. I'm willing to grant that. That's not controversial. But you would also have to have as another premise that natural selection selects for true belief. And I don't think they can justify that premise. That because natural selection selects for adaptive beliefs, it doesn't select for true beliefs. You would have to somehow show that by by selecting for mechanisms that are going to be adaptive, it also has to select for mechanisms that produce mostly true beliefs. And I don't know of any justification for it. Like okay. that's been like a hot topic in okay, you know, so... discussions around the evolutionary argument against naturalism for a while now. I don't think there's a successful demonstration that can be given, a successful argument that can be given that natural selection selects for mostly true beliefs. So I mean, that's just going to end the argument right there. Okay, so here's, here's my claim. If natural selection does not select somehow for true beliefs, then there's no reason to assume any human 
would be able to form true beliefs. No, not really. So how how do you think just, our beliefs can correlate to reality? I can just reject evolution and I wouldn't have it theater. So how if you, if I reject I will just reject the, uh, I will just reject the premise that we're all created by the same process. I will just reject that premise. And then I wouldn't have this the theater for my cognitive faculties which you would have. So I'm going to have to agree that this question of I'm not equipped to answer the question that you're asking of whether human beliefs correlate to reality or how. And I don't, yeah, I don't think I'm going to be able to get out of it. I'm going to have to go ahead and concede. Uh, okay. Not yeah, I, I think at minimum I'm going to have to go back to the drawing board on that. I might be able to come up with a justification for it, or I might not, but you make a good point. Mm -hmm.